So that is a straight line that has to be parallel to the edges of the canvas. If that was angled one way or the other, this vase would always feel like it was going to tip over. And what's nice about this too is now everything that happens is symmetrical to that axis line. And so I can just start to get those shapes. And it does not have to be exact, but I can start to see how that stacks up on the canvas. Now there's a lot of things to know about drawing. It's important to know that this ellipse is going to be wider than this ellipse because my my, uh, my eye level is somewhere up around here. So this ellipse is narrow. This would be a wider ellipse if we cut that jug in half. And then this will be a larger degree ellipse. Now you don't have to go in and put all that information in. Like that color wheel, that's something that we just know. So I'm just starting to get a sense of some of these shapes. And it's very thin. Get a little more paint on my brush. And again, I can use this viewfinder to say, uh, this, this apple is about right here. It's in front of the bottom of the vase. It comes over the, the front of that vase. And this apple, remember my rule of things have to either meet they have to either come over a half an inch out of the painting surface or be a half of an inch in. So this paint, this apple is going to be cropped out and that's fine, as is this apple. So we see the bottom of that apple there. Uh, and this viewfinder helps me to see that that apple crops also off at least a half of an inch. That eliminates a bad tangent. What you don't want is one of those apples edges just to come right to that edge of that painting. That would not be good. Okay, so we talked about blocking and shadows just as, as I did very quickly in that value lecture. So get a sense of where your shadows are right away. That's an important part of our composition. And there's a shadow on the apple, of course. So this apple is much like that orb that I drew in the value demonstration. And again, we're not looking for exact lines. We don't need the drawing to be perfect. We just want to be able to get a sense of, is it where we want it to be? Are things about the size we want them to be? Do we have about the right shapes? Now even this piece of pottery has light and shadow on it. But it's very dark. It's a very dark, shiny piece. I can put this away now. I don't need this anymore. The viewfinder. <coughs> and this vase, it does have shadow on it, but it also, because it's so dark and so shiny, it has reflections. It's got a shadow cast on it by that apple. And again, we can make all those shadows just one value. And this apple back here, is entirely in shadow. And this apple has shadow on it. So we're instantly breaking up those things into light and shadow. Now this is a good opportunity to step back and say, does this feel like a composition that I want to work on for the next three or four hours? Because I always like to point out to my students that this is the chance for you to wipe this out and start your composition over. In other words, if I could see that this is too big or too small or over too far to the left or what have you, then this is the time to change that. It's so much nicer to take care of these things at this early stage than to labor away on it for umpteen hours always wishing that you had moved something or made it bigger or smaller and then looking at it on the wall for the rest of your life and thinking, boy, I wish I had just moved that thing over. It's so much easier to do that at this stage right here. You might even make an indication where your highlight is because that is going to be a focal point. That's another great thing about the viewfinder. It really helps you to see 
where those focal points are going to be. You know, uh, the focal point will probably be this little apple here. So you want to make sure it's not right in the center. Now that we've talked about inspiration, we're going to move into that next component of painting, which is composition. And that's exactly what we're dealing with here. Getting our composition on the canvas. And, you know, so much of what we're going to be talking about as we go on into drawing, value, color, edges, that appeals to artists and it does appeal to the ordinary viewer, but I think what the ordinary viewer responds to most is composition. If they see a painting of something that just appeals to them, uh, they might not even be able to explain why they like it so much, but if it's composed in such a way that they just respond to it, I think that's often composition. You know, there are some real masters that I can point out, like uh, Norman Rockwell. Everybody loves Norman Rockwell. And I think a lot of the times it is the composition that he's come up with and the narrative that he implies into those compositions that makes folks just say, boy, I love that painting. I don't even know why I love that painting. It makes me laugh or it reminds me of something that, that I can relate to. So I have my composition. And this is my opportunity to say, do I want to paint this or, and look at it for the rest of my life? Or do I wish this was smaller or moved over or moved up? And uh, I think it's very important to know that it's much easier to wipe something out at this point. Uh, but I think I'm happy with it. But I just want you to understand, I would be very happy to just wipe this out and redo the drawing. What did the drawing take? The drawing took five minutes tops. Um, and, and it's so much easier to take another five minutes to get that drawing where you want it and get the things the size you want it. But when I look at my composition and where my highlights are and the way this focal point will be down here and then these highlights will lead me up to this dark shape and the way this nice shape of this vase is. I think I'm okay with it. So let's forge ahead. There's a lot of negative space in this composition. And the one thing I do like about this also is their shadow coming off of this vase onto the back of the setup. And I do love when I see shadows coming through lights and darks and such. And you'll see more of that as I block it in. There's even a little bit of light coming through under this apple on the setup. You're seeing it a little differently in the camera. But from where my eye is, I can see a little bit of light coming through here. And I think that'll be effective. But whenever we see light against the dark, against the light against the dark, then that's very effective. That's composition, that's light, that's color. That, that gives that feeling of air and, and such. So I think we're okay. I think my drawing is okay. And this is about as much time as I spend drawing anything. I don't, I don't spend, like if I'm doing a landscape or something like that, even a figure, I don't spend a whole great amount of time really getting everything perfect. One thing that I'm very aware of is I know that as I mass this in, which is kind of the next stage, massing in paint, that I am going to be correcting all the time. I don't just get a drawing and paint right up to the edge. I'm much more inclined to get a rough idea of where those shapes are and then overlap, always overlapping, pushing the paint into the paint and painting much more sculpturally. The next step is to block in the masses. And for that, I use the big brush. This is that Princeton, I believe it's number 20. The numbers don't always correspond, so don't go by the numbers. Just look for the big brush. And always use a bigger brush than you think you can handle, particularly at this blocking phase. The more paint you can get on there now and start to establish good paint layers, then I think that just lends to this uh, feeling of having a, a painterly work at the end. If we get real thin and put down mixtures that have no confidence to them, then it seems like a lot of times we're just pushing the paint around and putting more turp on there and rubbing it out with our paper towels and such. And that's just 
Not the way I like to paint. I'd rather paint directly and with confidence. And even as you're putting something down, if it's, you know, if you put down something that's too dark or too light or too warm or too cool at these initial stages, that's fine. Now, I'm not putting the paint down as heavily as I will be in an hour or two. I like to work up to that. And also, another key thing for me is I like to give myself somewhere to go as I block in here. So this next stage is it's kind of a combination of value and color. As I lay in these masses, the big shapes, I want to get not only the right value, how light and dark is it, and always maintaining that relationship between what is light and what is shadow, but I also want to get the right color or something like the right color. And as painters, what I do anyway, is I tend to work out of the middle. So if I'm painting something in the light family, I'm going to put in a darker color and work towards that lightest light. If I'm painting something in the shadow family, I'm going to put something in that's not as dark as I see it up there. Like if something was black up there, I wouldn't put in that black right away. I would mass it in with something that is maybe 80% gray and maybe not as dark as it's going to be eventually and work out to the darkest dark. So get, always give yourself somewhere to go. And that's also true with color. If something is red up there, I'm going to mass it in maybe not with that intense red that I see initially, but maybe more of an average red of what I'm seeing up there and then work out to those intense colors. And this is where I always say the subject reveals itself to you as you paint because uh, you're going to find that you may even think you're putting in an intense red or if you're painting a lemon that you're putting in an, an, an intense yellow. But often as you go on you just start to feel that light on that subject even more and you're, you're just going to pure yellow pigment and putting it on there and I think that's what you want to do. You want to always have some place to go. And a lot of times you can see what I'm talking about better by watching me paint than by uh, talking about it. So I also, I also like to paint from the largest to the smallest in general. From the general to specific. Get the big shapes out of the way and work up to the focal points and the smaller shapes. So the first thing I'm going to do is this white background. That's by far the largest thing on here and it's also the farthest back. So I'm going to take some of my white that I whipped up with that uh, whipped up with that linseed oil yesterday and I see that that color back there because that bulb in that uh, shadow box is somewhat cool it's it's a little bit cool that 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 gray of that white in other words I'm not going to lay in pure white out of the tube even though that's a white board back there I'm going to leave myself somewhere to go and put in something that's a, a grayish color. And a lot of times I'll get those warm, cool uh, vibrations going by mixing ultramarine and burnt sienna as I've mentioned already. But if you can start to establish correct relationships, so I keep adding a little more blue there and, and just lay it on there. Start to put it down with that big brush it may be wrong. Overlap your drawing, that's fine. Now, of course, since the canvas is white, it looks grayish and, and darker than it's going to look once I put in those big dark shapes on the vase in particular. So I don't mind if I go a little grayer, a little darker. I'm seeing some warm as it comes down closer to the fruit, probably the reflection of that cardboard which is kind of a warm color. You know cardboard, I have painted a lot of cardboard since I started using these shadow boxes and it's an interesting material. It's, it's, it's not always, uh, you think of it as brown and such but it's really not brown, it's kind of a gray. Now this is much darker over here as it goes into shadow. And again, I'm always leaving myself somewhere to go. So if this gets dark, that just means that I'll be able to come back with some more light. Now I'm trying not to get too brown or too, too blue. I want to find that balance between warm and cool. 
I think that's what you get a lot with these daylight bulbs. It is more like north light, where it's not warm and it's not cool. It's somewhere in between. And it's very intriguing to try to find those correct values and, and colors as a painter. So now I'm going to come back with a little bit of a light color and a little bit warmer color. So one, one mixture leads to the next. I'm starting to, to see colors in that background from that light hitting that white board. I'm even starting to see a little bit of pinkish or magenta. So I'll make a note of that and start to lay it in there. The more interest that I can get into this background, the better. In other words, I'm not just mixing up some big vat of gray paint and laying it in there. I want the back of this board, the back of the setup, to feel, you'll, I want the viewer to be able to sense that this light source is coming from up here. So the closer you get to that light source, the lighter it gets. And sometimes you can, you can even uh, go a little extreme and put something up there that's probably too light just to see. Oh, okay, that's, that's about as light as it gets up there. And it may be that when I get done blocking in this background that it's done. Now you see, I don't care if I go into the vase itself because I know I'm going to push that back. I'm going to sculpt that back with paint. So now we come over to that other side. It's very important to carry through and not stop. We want to do this whole background at once so that, so that it feels continuous back there. And it doesn't feel like, oh, well, you forgot to paint the background over there and come back and mix something up. And this is why I love these big brushes. You can really get a lot of paint on there. So now I'm going to put in the first dark thing that we've seen. That, that vase casts a shadow on the back of that setup. So I just work into my mixture here. There's no need to set up a new segment to, to mix. And, and for the first time, I'm putting in some dark color. So you can see how at this point we're off and on a roll and you'd hate to have to say, you know, I made that vase too big or that apple's in the wrong spot. And you really want to be confident. I think something that gives the energy to a painting is when you feel confident that you have things about where they need to be and about the right size. And I always say when I'm painting and when I'm teaching that I'm really happy once I get the canvas covered. So at some point we'll go through this and and uh, at some point I'll have everything blocked in and, and it'll start to feel like a painting. And that's, that's, a, that's a great feeling, particularly if it's working. So good time to step back and say, I'm feeling the light up here coming off that light source. I'm feeling that dark of that shadow. It'll be very easy to come in at some point and, and get a little lighter over here. But I didn't want to overstate it. Some light up around that rim. You want that light to flow across there. And I see more of that magenta color. These bulbs have a very cool kind of magenta blue uh, color off on their extremes. And the more you can make notes of that, the better. One great reason to paint general to specific is that when you get into this apple and this vase, you're not going to want to go back up into that background. You may decide at some point you need to go back, back up in that background, but it's like if I was just to paint this apple right now, that would be like eating dessert first or something. So this is, I'm eating my salad and such up here <laughs> and my uh, appetizers because if I get into, if I can get that stuff squared away, it supports everything I do after it. And, uh, and that gives you that feeling by the time you get to that apple that Oh yeah, I'm in the ballpark now. Because all of painting is relationships. What is the relationship between that background and that vase and the shadow the vase casts and this apple and how that interacts with the, with the vase and the cardboard? So I love to get all the supporting characters in there and then really focus on the, uh, the focal points. So even though that vase is a big blue shape and that's probably in terms of inches that has the most uh, impact. I, what I'm going to do is come down and get this cardboard uh, 
foundation in there. And I'm not going to paint it as though it's cardboard. I'm going to just paint it as though it's what, what I see up there, the value and, and color of it. And I can even work into my mixture that I have here. And again, it's very critical to just look at it and say, what color is it really? A lot of times we have preconceived notions of, of what a color is, you know. A lot of times in landscape, folks will paint trees, tree trunks brown. And, and I say, look at that tree trunk. Is that brown? It's actually kind of gray. Or sometimes they even have lichen on them and they're green and such. So I'm looking at this... Uh, Looking at this foundation down here, this cardboard, and I see that it's, it's, it's a grayish color. It's kind of cool, but it also has warm overtones. So just trying to find those tones in there. And again, leaving myself somewhere to go. So since this cardboard is mostly light, I'm going a little darker and a little richer than what I see up there. And this also has a, a gradation going from light to dark. It's going to be lighter, closer to that light source over on the left, and it's going to be uh, darker and richer and warmer as it goes off to the right. Now again, there's nothing really dark on this canvas at this point. So the odds are, this is going to be a little bit light, or once I start putting in dark, rich colors. So don't hesitate to go a little darker and a little richer than what you see up there. And also remember that warm's advanced. So if we get some of this warmth that I'm seeing, up at the front of this foundation, that's going to pull our eye forward a little bit. We're going to get that sense of space. Warms in front, cools towards the back. Okay, so I can start to put in some darks, those shadows coming off the vase and off the apples onto the ground plane of the cardboard. And remember I mentioned with shadows that they're, they tend to be darker and crisper closer to our objects. And again, I'm overlapping. I'm not just painting up to some perfect line that I have. I'm massing in. And if it gets, I would like it to get a little cooler, just as I'm seeing up there, and a little fuzzier as it goes away from that apple. When I'm teaching, I often say to the students that are saying, what color is this? What color is that? I say, and it sounds like I'm being a smart aleck, but I don't mean to be a smart aleck, but I think it's a good thing actually. The color is right in front of us. So the answer is right there. <laughs> like, I don't have the answer what color that is. You just have to mix up that color, like for this shadow. I have a lot of students say, what color are shadows? And this, this is very dark under this particular apple because it's closer to that light source and it's getting a crisp dark. And so, in a way, that sounds a little snarky to say the answer's right in front of you, but I've come to see it as a big gift. <laughs> it's not as though there's some secret code that you have to crack to, to paint. I think that it's a gift that, that as long as we learn to trust our eyes, our eyes are so amazing, and, and learn how to use our tools to capture what we see up in front of us, then we don't need to have uh, some, some secret uh, formula. I, I have people sometimes say to me these formulas like, if the shadow is in, the, it's got to be the complement of the color of the color of the light or whatever, you know, and these, these formulas. And I just always respond, like, just paint what you see up there and you'll be fine. Uh, don't worry about having a, a, a special code or uh, formula for light and shadow and color and all that. 
Just paint what you see and you'll be fine. Okay, I think the time has come to put in some of these real darks of this uh, pottery. And because it is a larger shape, I'm going to grab a little more paint. So I'm seeing a lot of ultramarine. And you'll notice I started with a good bit of white. That white gives us opacity and body. And I'm not going to go quite as dark as what I see up there. That's probably a little too light. And I'm also starting to see that it goes a little towards the the uh, purple or magenta. And I'm losing all my where I indicated those highlights and such, that's fine. And I'm going to just dull it down with a little bit of burnt sienna because I don't want to get too jewel-like right out of the color, right out of the gate. In other words, leaving myself somewhere to go. I want this color to be a little more muted initially. Uh, sometimes if we're not careful with things like ceramics or, or fruit and vegetables that are very colorful, we can get into those jewel colors right away and, and, uh, and lose that uh, feeling of having some place to go. <clears throat> it can be tempting to just uh, put down something right out of the tube and, and later we realize that we've lost some of that sophistication that it isn't just that pure blue right out of the tube. It's got some, some grays and some darks and such. So I am trying to keep in mind this axis line. The more I can hang on to that, particularly when I get up here into these shapes, the better chance I have of, of getting the drawing of this object right, this man-made symmetrical object. My cardboard is peeking out. So again, I feel like we're going in order of importance because I do think the apples are going to be the focal point of this, this painting. You can almost Think about what the name is going to be. You know, it's not going to be vase with apples. I think it's going to be apples with vase. And so you're really saving your greatest amount of energy for those apples. So I'm starting to put down some serious darks. And you can see how that's pushing that background back. And Again, I'm starting to put down a little more paint. It's, it's, this is not a thin paint layer. You can see it on the palette that the mixtures are getting thicker and darker. And that's okay. You can start to make an indication of where that uh, handle is. And all of this can be adjusted or changed later. But as you get comfortable with your brush, the odds are you'll start putting down strokes that, that have confidence. And, and I think that's what appeals to people. I think people can feel when you're painting with a lot of timidity and, and nervousness. Sometimes you just have to let it rip. You can always come in and correct things and change things. I could design, decide now that this painting needs a daisy or I need to put a piece of fabric in the background. Now I'm not making any provision for those highlights because I know that's going to be probably the last thing I do is put in those highlights on that pottery. So at this point I'm more concerned with value and color and drawing and even sometimes you might get a stroke that just looks terrific and, and needs to survive at least for a while. 
I do say when I teach that painting is kind of like juggling plates at this point. That's why it's good to have a vocabulary, even if it's just in your mind, a, a way of thinking of all the different aspects you're dealing with. Because at this point I am dealing with drawing, color, value, paint, how it's being applied. It may be that many of these strokes are the final strokes on this, and that once you put that highlight in there, that this painting is, is uh, done on this piece of pottery. Or it may be that I spend hours and hours and hours working on it and scraping it down. You just don't know. You can see how this edge picks up a reflection. <coughs> Off the background, that's what I say, uh, that's how I say that it continues to reveal itself to you as you're getting in. You see this goes darker and darker, it's very crisp here. And all this, I'm just working out of this area here. I you can see that I haven't really used much of my palette. I see a lot of painters who, they make different mixtures all the time, but I much prefer to mix into my mixture that I have going for, for my particular subject that I'm painting. So this is the story of the vase right here, as far as my palette's concerned. Eventually there will be a little section for apples and everything that we paint in, a, in this particular piece. So it's always good to step back and say, does my vase feel like it's leaning one way or another? It helps to look in the mirror and see it in reverse. But I think I'm in pretty good shape. And it's, it even has a feeling of light and shadow. There's also a reflection off of this apple here that, that, come, that reads as a dark. And there's a reflection off of the handle here. Now when I set this up, did I see that reflection there? I sure didn't.